And then uh, I'm going to hand over to Andre to tell you a little bit about EBCU and do some promotional work for the organization. Over to you, Andre. Thank you, Britt. Uh, can you all see my shared screen? Yep. Oh, super. So EBCU, the voice of the European beer consumer. EBCU um, is a non-political and also non-religious beer consumer organization. It goes back into May 1990 when it was founded by, I think it was four different uh, beer, beer consumer national organizations across Europe. Since then, we have grown. In 2008, we, we signed a proper constitution, which sort of like defined how we, how we should be structured. And in 2009, we also um, started getting professional secretary service via camera. And actually, this year, we were incorporated as so-called not-for-profit international non-governmental organization. So under Belgian law, so we, our official headquarters are in Brussels. And um, today we have 19 member organizations in total from 17 different countries. So you can see here from on the map to the right, that we cover most parts of uh, Europe, except well, East Europe. And unfortunately not Norway that Lars is from, but we, we used to have Norre as a member organization, but they went under quite a long time ago. But we're still keeping in contact with Hembrig, which is the Norwegian home brewing organization. And in total, we represent over 180,000 beer consumers across Europe. And um, our exec committee is, well, me, Andre from Finland, and then we have Hans Peter from Denmark, uh, Rianne from uh, the Netherlands, Chris from UK, and uh, Klaus Christian from Germany. Uh, our mission, well, is to preserve and maintain diversity of traditional beer cultures, and that's why we also are doing these workshops as a way to to preserve them and get them known to the bigger public. Then, of course, also to ensure that consumers receive best factual information. This can be anything like beer labeling, for example, and so on. And then also, we want to have our say on what we see, what could be unfair pricing in. In, in beer prices for us consumers. Among our activities is also that we lobby and give feedback uh, for, for the European Commission. For example, when they ask feedback, latest was on um, waste reduction among breweries and, and beer labeling that goes via that. And then also, of course, helping out with collaboration between our member organizations endorsing beer competitions we have a list on our website for we see are sort of like trustful beer competitions that a consumer can see as that is a, which which competitions are for like trustful that the consumers can understand that if somebody says that they have a gold medal that actually means that it's a beer competitions where where the judging of the beers has been done in a proper way that we we endorse and then, of course, education on beer. We have webinars like this for workshops. And our website, we also have these quite a new beer styles sub-website with uh, information, a lot of different beer styles in Europe and beyond. Also do work on beer and well-being. And then we have an annual reception in Brussels every year for invited guests in the industry and in the European Commission and European Parliament. Uh, future strategic goals, so continue with lobbying, gathering all our stakeholders, seeing what, what we, where we stand in the big global beer consumerist market and so on, public communication internally, and strengthening our member organizations. So it's, there's a lot of things that we, we try to work on to improve the situation. For, for the beer consumers in Europe. I guess that's it. Um, I think we directly now can jump over to Lars' presentation. I'm gonna stop sharing. Sure, I will try to share it. 
I have a slight suspicion this is not going to work, but oh, it does work. Strange. Yes, we can see it. Yeah. Super. Yeah. Okay. Um, then let's go. Um, so thank you for inviting me to speak about uh, Norwegian farmhouse sales. Um, I'm going to try and make this quite simple and not uh, go into any great detail. I guess if people have questions, we can do those at the end. So I, <laughs> this was supposed to be presented under the heading of explaining a beer style. And that's a little bit tricky because um, beer styles are a concept from commercial beer. Basically, you know, when the consumer sees a beer that they haven't seen before, the label, the product name, tells them something about what to expect in this beer, which makes perfect sense in the commercial beer world. But in the farmhouse brewing world, this is uh, pointless, meaningless, because um, those names didn't exist. And there, there was really no use for them either, because uh, let's say that you did visit somebody on a farm. Well, there was no beer choice. They had one beer and if they served it to you, you would have to drink it as a visitor. And that was that. So, <clears throat> they, of course, they had names for their beer, but the names were, well, to be honest, not very interesting. Very often, they just called it beer. Or they might call it malt beer to distinguish it from stuff that we wouldn't call beer, but that they called beer. Uh, in, in Sweden, they might even just call it drink. So, of course, there were differences in, in uh, farmhouse brewing, but those differences were so uh, dramatic and they changed in any direction you went, you would see some aspects changing and there would just be too many different varieties for all of them to have meaningful names, really. So the situation in Norway is that the ethnographic work that's been done over, yeah, let's say the last decade, has caused us to define some styles because now that there aren't so many brewers and there aren't so many different regions, uh, the brewing is a little bit more standardized than it used to be. And it's it's easier to come up with some names, but really in, in two of the cases I'm gonna talk about, the name for the style is just what people call farmhouse ale in the region that we're talking about. Um, and in one case, the name that we're using is actually not what the brewers themselves call the beer. It's just a name they use for outsiders. So just to warn you that the this, this style concept doesn't fit perfectly when it comes to farmhouse style. Um, I also want to address another thing, which is that there's a, there's a widespread assumption that in farmhouse brewing, the brewer would uh, basically like I said, not follow styles. And then that, this meant that they would just do whatever they wanted. Uh, and they would brew whatever, with whatever they had to hand. But as you will see quite clearly, that's very much not the case. Farmhouse brewing was, it might even be better to call it traditional brewing in the sense that what the brewer did and how they made the beer was dictated by tradition. Uh, by what they learned basically from the generation before them. And a commercial brewer has a lot of uh, scientific, uh, technical and theoretical knowledge that they can use to design a recipe. And they, they then can predict to some extent what happens when they change their recipe. Farmhouse brewers were not in that position. <laughs> So they knew how to make one beer, and that was basically it. They, they knew very, very well how to make this specific beer, but uh, the effect of a change was unpredictable for them, basically. So they generally wouldn't make much changes, although it has to be said that um, in a crisis, they would resort to substitutes, such as making their malts from oats instead of from barley, if the barley harvest is poor, stuff like that. And they would know how to how to treat the oats in, um, in a proper way as well. So the tradition did have room for some variation, although not very much. But I think that um, this type of brewing is so different from modern commercial brewing and, and the kind of brewing that people are used to, that uh, 
it doesn't really make any sense to introduce the beer style in the way that you would normally do. So I think it's better to go visit the brewer, see how they brew and try and understand how they do it and approach it from that direction instead. So in this case, we're going to a place called Kaupangir in Western Norway and a subregion called Songen. And we're meeting a brewer by the name of Carlo Ohl, who of all things is a climate scientist when he's not brewing beer. Uh, he's not actually originally from this region. Um, so when he moved there in 1992, he and his wife-to-be rented a house on this farm where we're uh, going to see him brew. And he, of course, was not a brewer at that time since he was from Eastern Norway. Um, and what he did was uh, when he married his wife, they were going to have a, a traditional peasant wedding. And then the people who owned the farm told them that, well, then you have to have traditional beer as well. So he joined them to brew that beer and has been brewing effectively the same beer ever since 1992. And so that's what he's going to show us. And this is the brew house. And when I talk about this type of brewing being completely different from modern brewing, I guess that's what you see here, right? Um, it's obvious right from the start that this is none of the forms of brewing that <clears throat> we're already familiar with. And one thing that's noteworthy is uh, he's brewing for himself. He's a home brewer. And you see the size of this kettle. And in fact, he has a second kettle behind it. So my first reaction on, on seeing this brewery, uh, brewery was to ask him, what batch size are you going to brew? And he says, 150 liters. Like it's the most obvious thing in the world. Uh, and what I was to find was that pretty much all of the Norwegian brewers brew 150 liters. And the standard barrel size in Norway used to be 141 liters. And I suspect they just... Uh, they made the equipment for the barrel size, basically, and never changed it. So the starting point for making a Norwegian beer, as Carlo told me, is juniper infusion. You don't brew with water, you're brewing with juniper infusion. So what you're doing is you're taking juniper branches, possibly with berries, possibly without, stuff them in the kettle, <clears throat> fill it with uh, cold water, and start a fire underneath. And you're making a sort of tea from these branches. So the tea obviously has a woody, junipery-like flavor. Um, it's usually pale green, but as you heat it more, it can go all the way to dark brown, like, uh, like tea, basically. And while Carlo was starting the fire and putting water in the kettle, he told me to go and get the juniper branches. And he said that, when you find the branches outside the door, take the ax that's also there and, and split one of the branches lengthwise. And of course I look at him and I go, why? And he just looks at me and he says, I don't know. Um, and then he's quiet for a moment and he says, you know, when my grandmother, uh, no, sorry, when my mother taught me to uh, make pork steak, she taught me that we have to cut off the ends of the steak. And of course, he did the same thing. He asked his grandmother and his mother, why, why do you have to do that? And she said, that's how we do it. And then later in life, he uh, had the bright idea to ask his grandmother. And grandmother says, that's because our oven was too narrow. So what, what he's saying uh, between the lines here is that when he learned to brew the spear, Nobody ever told him why he was doing any of these things. That's not how you learn traditional brewing. You've learned that you have to follow the sequence of steps. If you do that, you'll get good beer. But basically, the process was designed by people who had absolutely no idea uh, of the scientific underpinnings of any of this. So designed is even the wrong word. It's something that was arrived at by trial and error over a very long period of time. and so the knowledge of why was never really there. And this gets to what I was saying about being bound by tradition, right? At this point, it had been 
uh, more than 20 years since he learned to brew, and he was still splitting this branch lengthwise without knowing why. This is this is not somebody who's going to, on a whim, decide that, hey, let's put this stuff in the beer or let's make this change or that change. It's, it's really just not how this style of brewing works. So mashing is straightforward, pretty much uh, the English ma uh, method of uh, infusion mashing. Pour hot juniper infusion on the malt. And then Carlo was saying that you were supposed to do this until the mash paddle uh, just couldn't stand. It was would just start sliding off to the side um, if you let it go. But he didn't. Was, this was very confusing. He he didn't really care to or seem to care very much about his own rule. What he really did was he brought out the thermometer and made sure that he hit seventy two degrees, and then uh, we left the mash for for two hours. The second step is uh, lautering where. The whole mash gets moved into this barrel that you see that uh, Carlo called Rostabidne. Um, turns out this word for the Lauterton is at least a millennium old. So you can find exactly the same word in the same meaning in uh, Viking Age poetry. It's also found in uh, some Swedish and Danish dialects, so not just in Norwegian. But in, in this uh, vessel, the filter on the bottom is a wire mesh and juniper branches. Simple as that. And the uh, uh, there's no false bottom or anything like that. And the outlet is really just a very simple brass tap that uh, they've drilled a hole into the plastic barrel and then screwed in this, um, this tap. So you run off very slowly. And Carlo taught us that the... Um, the size of the stream out of the tap should be as thick as a woolen thread. So we were constantly tweaking this to get it right. And the way the process works is you run off one bucket of wort, pour it into the kettle, and then you pour another bucket of juniper infusion on. So for every bucket that you take out, you add uh, one bucket of infusion. And of course, <clears throat> there's a limit to how long you can keep doing this. And uh, Carlo knew from the amount of malt roughly how much beer he could expect to get. So he said 20 buckets. So when he started getting close to 20 buckets, he started tasting the wort. And basically, when the wort was no longer uh, properly sweet, that was when lautering was over. And this was the only measurement of gravity uh, that he did. So there's no there's no knowing really how strong the beer was because we did nothing to measure that. He just wanted to make sure it didn't get too weak and, and then he was satisfied. Boiling was in the kettle uh, with hops in the ordinary way. So nothing very remarkable to report there. This is how they filtered the um, hops out of the wort. So this is a, a filter that's made of two wooden branches and then the mesh uh, that's woven from a yeah, type of reeds. And then on top of that, there's a coarse cloth and it's, it's sitting on top of one of these barrels. So you're just pouring the wort through that. And if you go to Norwegian um, folk culture museums, you can see this type of seed in their collections, but this one was, was in use still. For the yeast, he was using ordinary ale yeast that he bought in the shop. And a couple of weeks later, I got this beer delivered to my door. And after tasting it and doing some calculations on the recipe, I guess it was about 10% alcohol. And you see the type of container, right? This is not pressurized. So there's almost no CO2. Uh, it's quite a sweet beer, very full bodied. You don't taste the alcohol very much. And you also don't. Most modern beers have this sort of backbone in the flavor that's the hot bitterness. And that wasn't really here. It was the bitterness from the juniper that was really holding the spirit together. 
And when I noticed that, then something started making sense because when we were adding the hops, I asked Carlo, what kind of hops are you using? And he said, I don't know. So he just got something from the homebrew store and that was that. Of course, this is entirely in line with how people used to do it because for Norwegian farmers, there used to be no named varieties of hops. You would take whatever grew outside your house, basically. And of course, with the amount that he was using, uh, he would probably get, if it was a standard noble hop, which it probably was, you would get something like seven IBUs. So uh, the, the bitterness level is just absurdly low for a 10% beer. But it was a really good beer. Um, very smooth, scarily drinkable for, for 10%. caramelly and so on from the malts. Um, so now I guess we can say that we uh, we have a sort of style made in the region that you see shaded on the map there. And in, in this entire region, it's made roughly the same way. Uh, in some regions, they boil a lot more than what Carlo did. So he boiled for an hour, but other places they can bo boil for four or five or even six hours. Uh, and if you do, you get a very uh, strong caramel flavor from this boil. And the people who, who do this type of long boil also tend to use a lot more hops than Carlo did. Um, so the bitterness then balances the hops. Typical uh, strength is 8 to 12%. And the low carbonation is, is very typical. Um, the brewer that we saw now used commercial yeast but in the region to the south from where he brews everyone uses kraik and then if you go even further south it's a mix of kraik norwegian farmhouse yeast and commercial yeast i think i should add that low carbonation is something that's typical essentially for all farmhouse ale. it doesn't matter whether it's russian or estonian or finnish or swedish it's all uh, very low carbonation because uh, carbonation is something that's only been reintroduced into beer over the last couple of centuries. Um, basically because when you didn't have access to pure sugar that you could weigh, um, making a carbonated beer was very, very difficult. Essentially because you couldn't control the amount of carbonation. So it's very easy to make a, a bomb instead of carbonating your beer. And carbonation in beer is something that people had to get used to, which, which is a process that must have taken quite a long time. And for these styles, carbonation just still isn't part of the style. So in, in uh, the mouthfeel and some of the flavor profile, it comes across as very similar to English cask ale. Okay, that's one style. Uh, it's called Heimabrig. Uh, which literally means just homebrew, but in the shaded region, most of the brewers seem to use this name for local farmhouse ale, and it's not really used outside of that region very much. So we've decided to use that as the name for the style, basically. So this was a scene with modernized, very strange type of beer, I think. And before we move on, I want to say a little bit about how did it come to be this way? Why, why is it strange? And the, the starting point for, for this type of beer really lies very, very, very far back in the past. So what you're looking at here is a burial mound in Denmark at a place called Egtid. It's from 1400 before Christ. And a young girl was, was buried in this uh, barrow with a uh, bucket of beer. And of course, this beer that was brewed for her was not a commercial beer because there were no commercial breweries at this time. So the origins of farmhouse brewing in Scandinavia lie at least as far back as this. In reality, probably a few millennia even before this. And 
the logic behind this type of brewing is actually incredibly simple. So until, say, the last 150 years, what people in the countryside made their living from was they grew grain and then they ate it. They were, for the most part, outside of the money economy. And since they all grew grain, it meant that when the autumn came and they gathered it in the grain, they had everything they needed to make beer. The only thing that was missing was basically putting in some work. So they needed juniper, which you just find in the forest. The hops would usually grow along um, one of the walls of the house. Water was easy. You had the grain, you malted it yourself. And the yeast, as you will see later, they had themselves and just maintained from brew to brew. So in a sense, you could say that the beer was free. Certainly it was free in the sense that they didn't pay any money for it, but um, there was a cost in the sense that any grain that you turned into beer was grain that couldn't be used for food. So it was strictly speaking, the surplus grain that they brewed from, which uh, effectively constrained how much they could brew. And just to give you a sense of how widespread this was, each of these yellow dots is a place where I can document that there was a tradition for brewing on the farms, which makes sense, right? Because if it was free, essentially they all did it. And if you go back, yeah, let's say a thousand years, uh, in Western Norway, there was actually a requirement by law uh, that people brew beer for two specific occasions in the year. So we know that for a very long time, essentially every single farm has been brewing. The, the reason I put um, the height coloring on this map is so you can see that the places where there are no dots are basically those places that are too high up for grain farming. Of course, there's some regions by the, uh, by the sea as well, where there are no dots because um, the early on became easier to buy the beer than to brew it. And I should add that there's really nothing special about Norway, except that the brewing is well documented and, and lasted into quite uh, late historically. If you've seen this, uh, if we'd had similar documentation for say the UK in the 1700s, the map would have looked pretty much the same, yellow dots all over it or Germany, doesn't matter. So if you see beer history from a really, really high perspective, then in the beginning, there is only farmhouse ale, there's nothing else. And the commercial breweries really only get started around the time that uh, the towns start to grow in size, let's say 1100, 1200 after Christ. And the reason that you get breweries in towns is that the people who live in towns don't have any fields. So they have to buy the grain if they're, if they're going to make beer, and then they might as well just skip that and, and buy the finished product instead. And of course, with a lot of people in a small area, you have a ready-made market. And the town is basically surrounded by farmers, all of whom know how to brew. So of course, they're going to start businesses. And what the sources say is that around 1200, um, Northern German breweries come up with the idea of boiling the wort with hops in it. That makes a more durable product that you can export to other towns. And you see the result on the equipment that these breweries use because within a hundred years, suddenly uh, kettle sizes grow to like four or 5,000 liters, at which point you're no longer a farmhouse brewery, your, your needs and requirements, to put it that way, have, have become different from those of the farmers. And so commercial brewing starts developing as a separate branch of brewing. This carries on to, for example, London Porter breweries in the 18th century, who uh, start scaling up to uh, millions and millions of liters. They start using steam engines. They start using thermometers, they start measuring the sugar. And the brewing that we know, craft brewing, industrial lager brewing, uh, modern home brewing, all of that comes out of this same upper branch of brewing. And meanwhile, 
while this development was going on and giving us, you know, Guinness and Brewdog and what have you, the farmers just kept doing their thing quietly. And the technological development that happened on, on the farmhouse level, as you just saw, was very much slower. I like to say that the, the, the two big technological improvements that happened in farmhouse brewing over the last three, four centuries are the introduction of the metal kettle, which in Norway seems to have happened around 1600. And secondly, the introduction of the garden hose, which meant that you could just get water from a tap for brewing instead of having to drag it out of the well and then carry it up to the farm. And when we're talking about for a normal brew, probably 300 liters, that's actually quite a big uh, life improvement, to put it that way. So given that this is my view of beer history, I've essentially stopped thinking of beer in the way that Michael Jackson taught us and as separated into spontaneously fermented, top fermented and bottom fermented. And instead, I think of it as basically being divided into farmhouse ale and modern brewing. The, the difference between farmhouse ale and any top fermented style is just vastly greater than the difference between modern ale styles and, and lager styles. So that was a bit of background, uh, but I was, I was supposed to tell you about beer styles. So let's do a second beer style, again, by visiting the brewer and, and seeing what he's doing. We're still in Western Norway, although now we're further north. In a village called Hornendal. So the brewer is Tadjer Aftewal. This time he's a local. So he first brewed the beer alone when he was 17 years old. So he learned to brew from his uncle. And his uncle brewed his first solo beer at the age of 14 in 1944. He learned to brew from uh, Tadia's grandmother. And essentially they all brewed in the same way. There's, there's no... There's no major changes to the brewing process in all of that time, as far as I know. And as you can see here, Taille is cutting the juniper branches because he's going to make juniper infusion exactly like Carlo did. But when Taille mashes, what he does is he takes infusion, malt, stirs it with a mash paddle, adds some more, stirs some more, and then at some point he just stopped. And, and I hadn't seen any thermometers. So I, I was just looking at his back thinking, what are you doing now? How, how, how do you know that you're at the right mash temperature? Um, and much later I learned what was going on. So he, he boils the infusion. So it's uh, at hundred degrees. And then he mixes it with malts, which are at room temperature. And the mix is how he judges temperature. And this was what Carlo uh, had been taught, that you should, you should put the mash paddle into the mash and when it slides off to the side, that's when you have the right mix. The reason Carlo didn't really care about this rule anymore was that he was following the thermometer and not this rule. Uh, but he was still kind of half-heartedly uh, checking it. So although Tairie didn't have a thermometer, I brought one and, and I put it in and it showed 74 degrees, which according to brewing theory is just way too hot. It should give you a uh, unbearably sweet beer, basically. So I asked Tairie, 74 degrees, it's kind of hot, isn't it? And he just said, well, you know, it's, it's summer. I don't normally brew in the summers and maybe the malts were a little warmer. Uh, and that was the end of the discussion. He, he uh, didn't seem concerned at all. So when he brewed again in November, they sent me a message. 
73.8 degrees, they said. And then uh, when they brewed again in March, they just sent me a photo of the thermometer showing 73.9. So he really uh, is able to hit the, uh, the right temperature uh, without a thermometer. And in fact, uh, before I, um, I went to visit him, I tried to get the recipe from him. And one thing I noticed that I didn't get was his mash temperature. And it's only after brewing with him that I realized that he didn't know the mash temperature. Of course, he didn't need to know because he could hit it without the thermometer, but still. Uh, here, he is preparing the filter, just like Carlo did, juniper branches uh, in the same way. The difference is that uh, someone is not muted. It would be great if you could mute. Um, Unlike Carlo, you see that he's dipping the juniper branches in steaming hot uh, juniper infusion. So he's standing there in clouds of steam, making the filter, which was a bit odd. Uh, it was a while before I realized why he was doing that. Lautering is uh, done the same way, but with a twist because here, when you run off the wort, it goes into milk pails and the milk pails go outside into this water basin uh, where they get cooled with running water. You notice something strange now? We didn't do the boiling, right? Um, so this is actually the reason why Taiye is not, or is, is sanitizing the juniper branches. Yeah, someone's someone. still got their microphone on. Would be really great if you could turn it off. Thank you. I don't think anyone has, um, uh, Lars. I, I, I've just checked and everyone is muted, so I'm not sure where the feedback's coming from. Okay. Nothing we can do there, I guess. Um, I'll just carry on. Um, where was okay. I? Yeah. So the reason he was doing this was that since he's not going to boil the wort afterwards, uh, he has to be sure that these juniper branches are clean, that nothing... Uh, from them sticks to the wart. So that's why he's doing this. Um, let me see. So what do you do about the hops when you don't boil the wart? Well, in this case, there, there are many different solutions for that. But what Tadia does is he just leaves a bag of hops floating in the milk pail. So the wart runs through that. And uh, when the pail is full, you just take the bag and you move it into the next milk pail. Then cool this one and, and start running off into the next one. So in, in terms of uh, international bitterness units, Thaddeus beer sits at zero because it's not boiling the hops. Uh, I thought that was very strange. Uh, like, is he, is he just aping what other people do because he knows the hops um, protect their beer? But it turns out that hops actually do protect against infection even if you don't boil them the the protection is lower but it, but it's still there and unlike carlo uh Thayde had his own yeast so this is this type of yeast that's called quake um after the dialect word basically in the for yeast in the regions where they use it so he's um what he's holding in his hand there is dried chips that he took from the freezer that morning. So it's just been sitting in the brew house and thawing by itself during the day while he was brewing. And the first wort that comes off the, the lauter ton goes into this plastic bucket. Once it's cooled to roughly body temperature, he just drops the, uh, the chips in. And while he's dropping the chips in, he, he looks at me and he says, we call this Māori Aua. And I, I thought that was very strange because uh, it really means uh, Māori's eyes. So Māori is, uh, is a woman's name. And the eyes sort of make sense because you get these bubbles afterwards, right? But who is Māori? Uh, I found this in a 19th century dictionary of dialects later. Uh, it's, it's not Māori, it's... Uh, Maria, uh, or in English, Mary. So it's really, it really means the eyes of the Virgin Mary. 
Now, Norway has been a Protestant country since 1537. So this is not a new brewing term that he's using. One thing that's noteworthy here is that these are dried chips, right? You see the, uh, the time on the upper right there, 1430. That's the time according to my camera when I took this photo. Next one is 31 minutes later and the yeast is already visibly fermenting. And Tai Ye was expected this. So he was, yeah, okay, it's alive. And he puts the, puts the cloth back over the bucket. But for a modern brewing, this is, it shouldn't be possible. Yet with crack, it's, it's completely normal. Then once we've uh, run off all the wort and cooled it, Tairier just pitches the bucket into the fermenter and closes the lid. And then 48 hours later, we have Upskoke, which is the traditional party in the brew house when the beer is finished. So it's really 48 hours from pitch to party. This... Um, this party is a tradition in, in the brewing regions of Norway. Uh, some places, the tradition is that you invite those people that you want to have at your Uppskåke. But in other places, the neighbors have basically just been watching your brew house. So they saw that you were brewing on Sunday. And then they know that, yeah, Tuesday evening, Tidy is probably going to be there. And I see, yeah, there's light in the brew house. There's smoke from the chimney on Tuesday evening. Okay, it's going to be a party. So you just head over. And I think if you know anything about brewing, you're going to be somewhat confused about how does this actually work. Uh, and particularly, of course, the um, non-boiling of the wort. So if we turn to the textbook, why are we boiling the wort? Well, it says we should kill the microorganisms in the wort. We need to isomerize the alpha acids in, in uh, the hops so that they actually dissolve in the wort and you get a, a bitterness in the beer and protection against infection. Uh, you want to coagulate the protein so that it drops out. And you also want to dis uh, deactivate the enzymes from the malt so they don't keep breaking down dextrins uh, in the beer because you want some remaining sugar after fermentation. So then if you don't boil, what happens? Well, you mashed for over an hour at more than 70 degrees. The microorganisms in this mash are not going to be very healthy. Let's put it that way. You, you have pasteurized the mash. There is, there is no need to kill the microorganisms one more time, basically. If you don't boil the hops, well, then you don't get any alpha acids. It's as simple as that, but it still has an effect as I was explaining earlier. Uh, and when it comes to the protein, well, since you're not coagulating them and having them drop out, they're gonna remain in the beer. So what this basically means is your beer will have a different flavor. It's a little bit, you can think of it as every recipe that you've seen for tomato soup says you should boil the soup, right? And then you go to Spain and they make gazpacho where they don't boil the soup. It turns out that works too. It just tastes different. And, and it's kind of the same with this. Uh, and then when it comes to the enzymes, they're going to keep working in the fermenter. Of course, the fermenter is uh, not at the optimal temperature, let's put it that way, for the enzymes. But they have 48 times as long as they did in the mash to do their thing. So... This is the reason why Taille was uh, mashing at 74. When I've brewed this beer, if the mash temperature is too low, then you end up, if it's 67, for example, you end up with a beer that's much too dry and it becomes sharp and unpleasant. If you mash at 74, you, you actually get a more reasonable uh, final gravity and sweetness in the beer. And I think, I think the 74 degree thing is a perfect illustration of Tidy. I had no idea that this was what was going on, but he was doing the right thing because the people who have experimented their way to this process over many, many centuries, they definitely arrived at something that works, even though 
they can't explain why it works. Yeah, and just in case you're skeptical about the pasteurization, here's the pasteurization table for, for milk. And you see in the second row, 72 degrees, if you're pasteurizing milk, then 15 seconds is enough. Of course, the uh, the mash is, is grainy and lumpy, so it's not going to be as quick as milk, but we're talking at least two hours here of mashing. So, uh, tell you, this beer is what we call a raw ale, which is uh, a beer where the wort is not boiled. It's not the only style of raw ale. There's, there's quite a lot of them, but... In general, uh, when you don't boil the wort, you get a fuller mouthfeel because of the remaining protein. And this is this is pretty much like using oats or wheat, except the flavor of barley protein is a little bit different from that of uh, oat and wheat. Makes the beer hazy in, in much the same way. And one difference with oat and wheat is that the, the barley protein has a slightly slightly sharp flavor can be almost peppery sometimes, but normally it's more like it's uh, a slight burn. So this means that a raw ale tends to be self-balancing. The sweetness tends then to be balanced by the raw character instead of necessarily by the hops. Um, and then of course, all of the chemical processes that happen when you boil wort, well, they don't happen here. And again, that's why the beer tastes different. So you, you tend to get uh, flavors of straw and grain and something it's hard to put a name to, but it's like green shoots almost. So anyone who knows brewing tends to ask, what made these people stop boiling the beer? And of course, this is completely the wrong question. Uh, if we go back to an archaeological find that's even earlier than Eggtved Girl, uh, this is yeah, 5,000 years ago, roughly. This is um, in the Stone Age. This is before um, people had access to bronze and other metals. So you see it's a grave find. And you see the grave drawn on the left there. And you can see uh, the black shape is the body of the man that was buried. Right next to his arm there is a battle axe, but it's made of flint because this is the Stone Age, right? And the beer itself was in this ceramic container on the upper right. So how would this guy boil his beer? Of course he didn't. He didn't have any container to boil it in. At that time, all beer uh, must have been raw ale. And if you think about this for a moment, you'll see that his problem will not have been how to boil the wort. You don't need to boil the wort. We just saw that with Tadia. His problem will actually have been something more fundamental. How do you mash? Right? You have to get the mash up to 65, 67 degrees. Now, how do you heat it if you don't have a metal container? And the answer to that, like uh, so many solutions from farmhouse brewing is ridiculously simple. You make a fire, you put stones in it, take a wooden vessel and mix um, cold water and malt, and then you drop hot stones in until you heat it to 65. In fact, these people generally heat it well beyond 65. They would uh, usually boil the mash. But if you're adding the stones slowly, then the temperature goes up slowly. You go through all the right temperatures and you uh, eventually beyond them. But if it's slow enough, that's no problem. It's perfectly fine. So this seems to have been the standard brewing process in much of Europe for a very, very long time. And the reason that so many farmhouse brewers still don't boil the wort is um, this is a bronze kettle from the Bronze Age almost 4,000 years ago. Does this look like a a poor farmer's ordinary kitchen uh, vessel. You see, it's, it's uh, highly decorated. It will have been much more decorated than what we're able to see on the remains now. At, at that time, uh, a bronze kettle was something that only basically princes and major chieftains owned. And they would not be using it for making uh, soup or beer. 
They were mostly used to serve beer, not to, not to make it. So uh, production of metal remained inefficient for long enough that as late as 15, 1600 in Norway, a kettle was uh, still almost unaffordably expensive for an ordinary farmer. So kettles don't seem to have become common in Norway until the 1600s. And of course, that's going to leave its mark on the brewing processes. When it comes to uh, the quake, this, these dots are showing places where people say that they used to have their own brewing yeast that they maintained themselves from brew to brew. Um, when you pitch yeast into a beer and it ferments, you end up at the end with more yeast than you had when you started. So essentially you have a surplus of yeast and you can just keep using it forever as long as it doesn't go bad. And that's what people did in all of these places. Of course, they did it in many more places where I just don't have the documentation. And you see the dots continuing to Sweden, right? Would be the same in Sweden, Finland, Russia, the UK, Germany, any place you care to name. And the reason people did it this way is that in Norway until 1870, you, you couldn't buy um, yeast from any yeast manufacturer. Nothing like that existed. So you had to have your own brewing yeast and maintain it yourself. And in commercial brewing, that's also what all of the breweries did until 1883. So there's really less of a difference than you might think between um, commercial brewing and farmhouse brewing. However, as you saw, uh, Tadius yeast was not behaving like a modern commercial yeast. And uh, although I didn't say it, he was also fermenting at a much higher temperature. He was fermenting at 30 compared to the ordinary 20 for an ale brewer. Uh, but you can you can still find people using cryic who are fermenting at, at 40 degrees without any trouble, which wouldn't work with the modern commercial yeast. So over the last few years, we've had uh, genetic work that's given us kind of a picture of the, the different types of, of uh, yeah, yeast that exist, basically, both wine yeast and beer yeast and other types. Um, and we've been able to place Kraik into this picture. So what you're looking at here is the five main groups of European yeast, basically. It turns out there are, there are two big groups called beer one and beer two of uh, brewing yeasts. The mixed group is beer yeast, bread yeast, and liquor yeast all mixed up. And then you have the wine yeast, which is closer to beer two. Um, and then, of course, there is wild yeast. Uh, and we've also found that the beer two yeasts are mostly Belgian yeasts with some uh, British ones mixed in. Saison yeast, which people think of as a, as a farmhouse yeast, and it probably is, uh, belongs to the beer two group. The uh, beer one group also has some uh, geographic substructure. You can see the Belgian and German yeasts from one side. British and American also separated from those. To everyone's surprise, Kraik turns out to belong uh, to this group. So it's kind of startling, but anywhere you go in Western Norway, if people have their own yeast, genetically, it always belongs to this group that we call Kraik. It's always closer to that than to anything else. So there's a single type of yeast that's genetically, like, uh, genetically recognizable the people in Western Norway use. And it turns out it belongs to the beer one family, although it's split out uh, earlier than the other ones that we know. So Kraik is definitely a domesticated ale yeast. It's just one that's very different from modern commercial yeast because it has been used in a very different way. We don't have time to go through it, but if you, uh, if you look at the documentation historically of how people used Kraik and the circumstances under which they did, you can see the quake actually matches the way that they've been using it. Okay, so in this case, we're looking at a beer style called Kornal, which literally just means grain beer. Um, 
people said that to distinguish it from what they called sugar beer or juniper berry beer and stuff like that. Um, it tends to be made from very pale malt because in this region, the tradition was to uh, mostly to dry your beer, uh, your malt in the sun. Some places they smoked it and some places they still do. Cornell uh, is a raw ale, although in the last, uh, let's say, three decades, some people have started boiling the wort. Uh, always fermented with crack, not as strong as the Heimabrig to the south, six to eight percent. Also with the low carbonation for the same reason. Yeah, and I think those uh, region names don't mean much to you. You can you can see the region on the map anyway. So. Let's turn to the third style. And the third style was a bit unusual because it's less defined by the brewing than by how they make the malts. Because this is a style of beer where you have to use local malts made in the region. Otherwise, it's just not going to have the right flavor. These brewers also tend to say that if you have good malts, you can hardly fail to have good beer. Meaning, brewing is not difficult. Malting is difficult. And so, yeah, we'll, we'll get back to some of the consequences of that. So the way that uh, farmers all over Norway used to make the malts was according to uh, a little rule. It said three days in the brook, which is what they're doing here. This is really taking a sack full of barley and then you're just dumping it in the stream. Um, Norway is full of short streams that just run down out of the hills or the mountains with really clean water. The perfect way to um, soak the grain. You even get uh, oxygen added and impurities uh, removed by the stream. So it's, it's a really perfect way to do it. So three days in the brook and three days in the sack. So you take it up and you put the sack, which you'll notice now is considerably more full because the grain is swollen. You put it somewhere reasonably warm and the grain will start to germinate as the water starts to run off. Eventually you see the rootlets coming out through the sack. Then you'll spread it out and continue the growing until you judge that the, um, the shoot through the grain has become long enough. And that's when you need to stop and you need to dry the molds. Now drying was done in so many different ways it deserves a whole book uh, but we're only going to look at one method because it's the one that i used in this region uh, the uh, the drying kiln is called the soin uh, and that's what you're looking at here so if you look down on the floor you see there is a, a black square that's the opening to the oven and you see the glow of red that's where the fire is so they're burning wood in there and this concrete box that you see is completely empty except for the fireplace. So it's just there for the, for the heat and the smoke to spread out. And then you see the malts on top. It's there on top of um, wooden planks with holes drilled into them. So the, the heat and the smoke goes up through these holes and then through the grain bed and dries the malt. Of course, it's going to powerfully smoke the malt, right? One of the things that you're really concerned with when you're drying malts in this way is that you don't want the wood to burn. And that's done, oh, I don't have a picture of it. I thought I was gonna have, sorry. Uh, inside the fireplace is essentially a, a ring of stones around the fireplace and then on top, a piece of slate. So the heat and the sparks will hit the slate and then go sideways so that it gets spread better and reduces the chance of, uh, of starting a fire. So two days, basically, of drying like this is necessary. And in this area, they always, always use older wood for the fire. Um, there's a whole bunch of reasons probably why they use older, but uh, the most important is that older has a very characteristic smoke aroma. This malt does not taste like German beech uh, smoked malts, which you probably know, also tastes different from peat smoked malt. So this is a third kind of smoked malt, basically. 
So uh, the brewing process in this case is, I actually start the evening before by putting cold water on the mash and you just leave it cold overnight. So this is an acid rest. You're lowering the, the pH to get better efficiency. How, how do farmers know that you should do that? I don't know, but they do. They worked it out somehow. Um, then in the morning you add hot water, run off the wort, warm it up in the kettle until it gets roughly to boiling point and you pour it back on. It's not quite decoction, but it has some similarities. Some of these brewers boil the wort and others don't, but uh, in, in a pale, straightforward beer like Kornel, you can taste the royal flavor really easily. In this beer, uh, that's not so easy because what hits you is the smoke. It's just massively smoked. And usually they ferment with baking yeast. And interestingly, baking yeast tends to behave very much like crike. Very fast fermentation, like high temperatures and so on. Um, as for the flavor, so this is from the first major tasting that I was at, where we managed to convince a bunch of brewers from this region to give us, I think, 15, 20 different samples. Uh, the, the flavors in the set of beers were just so out there that uh, we were pretty experienced tasters, even in farmhouse ale by this point, but we were just completely floored. Um, it was, they, most of the beers had a flavor like uh, lingonberries, and it's sort of fruity, and of course the massive smoke. Uh, and then beyond that, they tended to vary dramatically. So th there was one that was made by a guy who really, really wanted to showcase his malts. So he used no hops, no juniper, uh, and he even used lager yeast to get as little uh, yeast profile uh, as possible. And then when you tasted his beer, it was it started with like a perfect attack of the smoke flavor and then faded out perfectly into nothing. He, he was really, he set up the whole beer to show you, see what I can do with the malts. Uh, and then you get the next one and it's, it smells vanilla, toffee, and like somebody's armpit. Fantastic beer, but very, very weird. And then the next one is something else again. And what you should know is that all of these people are using barley from the same little county. They're all using older wood and they are all using roughly the same malting and brewing process. And yet the results are all over the place because when you're making your own, when you're making your own malts, you basically have access to flavors that you can't make through the brewing process. And you have access to flavors that modern maltsters are not making. So um, you might not see where the region is in this case, because it's, it's really just a single county uh, where they're still brewing like this. Um, I think the reason the brewing is so restricted is that uh, they are so dependent on the malts and for the malts, you need a separate building. You have to maintain an entire building. So brewing in this region was really difficult and so somebody came up with the idea of basically making an association of say 10 or 15 people who, who maintain the building together. You typically only use it like two or three days a year anyway. Uh, and once they did that, they really got the farmhouse brewing onto, onto a firm foundation. So this, this county is called Stjardal and the name of the style is Stjardal. It really just means beer from Stjardal. Um, when the brewers talk to each other or to their neighbors, they will call this Maltal. That was always the name for the local farmhouse ale, but uh, Stjerdal has, has become the, the name that's used with outsiders. It's an exonym, if you will. So they always use uh, local barley that they malt themselves with the same type of equipment, always older wood, may or may not boil, usually use this brewing process that I described. Uh, originally, they did use juniper and hops. Some have stopped using one or both. Baking yeast is the most common, but some use ale yeast, some use lager yeast, and a, a few have started using crake. 
strength of the beer is highly variable. Uh, low carbonation here too. Yep. So that was three styles. Let's try and summarize it. Um, you see the three regions here. So high Mabrig in the south, characterized by the long boil, often uses crack, but not always. Then you have corner, which <laughs> doesn't boil, always uses crack. And then you have the stirred also, which is which is really defined by the smoked malts. And it's um, we're talking seriously powerful smoke aroma here. Uh, Rauch beer has has nothing on this stuff. There was even uh, there was even a beer by Mikeller that was supposed to be the heaviest smoke beer ever, and we had it together with stirred also, and it's like yeah, it tastes like water. Um, the baking yeast, as I said, is, is the most common type of yeast. The Stierdal region used to have their own yeast until the mid-1970s. Appears to be dead now, despite uh, attempts by the locals over the last few years to, to revive it. This is uh, the places where people are still brewing farmhouse ale today. As you can see, it doesn't match my regions perfectly. So there are people here brewing two different kinds of beer, one of which is smoked and the but more lightly, uh, and the other which is generally not. The people here brewing very strange beers, they also maintain their own yeast, but it's not great, it's different. Um, and then there are brewers here, which, yeah, that's a complicated story that I'm gonna skip, and there's a few brewers still in this region. So we, we have, it's probably fair to say we have seven or maybe eight styles of farmhouse ale, but only three of them are large enough to have been properly defined, basically. Uh, and of course, historically, when when um, everyone was brewing, the picture was a lot more complicated. Questions? Wow. Oh, oh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, I want to do one thing before I do questions, because I'm going to remove the slides. just wanted to say that if you want to know more about the... Um, Norwegian farmhouse sales, you, you can get the book on the left, which it covers all of Europe, but it's got all the Norwegian styles in it. Thank you. Uh, so it's absolutely fantastic. And and thank you. Um I, I'm gonna read out some of the questions from the uh, the chat window. There's only a few, but I'm sure more will come in. But I just wanted to say a thank you for that. I feel I've learned a lot about not just Norwegian farmer sale, but brewing prehistory and sort of how brewing started it, it, it was absolutely fantastic so thank you thank you on a personal level from myself so some questions that have come in um uh right okay so um so ra um answered this one but tina's asked do we already know about hops that far back or did that come later, similar to when it was they were uh, being uh, when they were being used in Germany? I responded, the old, oldest documented use of hops he knows is from Norway, and was from an archaeological excavation in Kristiansand in 2018, when 50 to 60 hop seeds were found in a Viking burial from the year 800 uh, CE. CE. Um, and he mentioned the fact you blogged about the early history of hops. So maybe you want to comment on that? Well, it's absolutely true what he says. Uh, it's perfectly right. Um, so uh, hop usage appears to go quite uh, a bit further back than that. So the oldest find is from Italy, northern Italy, 600 before Christ. It's a little bit contentious. And there's one from the other side of the Alps, just after Christ, which is also a little bit contentious. Uh, but then there are a few more in that South German region in, in the same period. But uh, we don't know how they use these hops. And, and it's kind of hard to say how common it was. It looks like it came into use and then the use gradually spread and then suddenly the, the, the spread speeded up. Um, but you know the UK famously was a latecomer to hops, where uh, it was it was really introduced, say in the in the 14th and 15th centuries, and it took a good while to to take over in British beer, and that was probably the case also in most places. But 
This seems to have happened earlier elsewhere. Um, the process is not really finished still. Uh, in Finland, roughly half the farmhouse brewers are not using hops still. Okay, thank you. Um, some more questions then. Um, so Andreas sent me a comment that the Kama label is really cool. It resembles a red, a bit red hook ale, uh, the brewery's logo from Seattle. <laughs> Not a question, it's a comment. Uh, oh, I, I want to comment on that one, though. Oh, um, please do, please do. Uh, so the the shape that was on that label is what's called a bu marke. It used to be that uh, Norwegian farmers couldn't read and write. And so every farm would have uh, a sign like that that was their symbol. So they might carve it onto something they own, that they might also use it to to sign documents and stuff like that. So it's it's really the um, the boom I get for that farm. Okay, and uh, uh, um, a question from Tim: um, How does farmhouse ale relate to the Gulatung Tsing uh, law? Um, this is very geeky, I'm sure. Which legend says commanded Norwegian farmers to brew beer as a duty? Yeah, so so um, this this is not legend. The um, we have the text of the Gula Thing Law, which covered Western Norway and Viking times, um, in three or four different versions, and there are very clearly two paragraphs that state that you are required to brew beer. Um, and of course, it was farmhouse ale that they were brewing then. This was a law that applied to the farmers that said every farmer had to brew. And of course, farmhouse ale was going to what they're going to make. I don't think at that point in history that there was anything else in Norway. Um, if you read the law more carefully and you look a bit at the context, you see that the requirement is not simply to brew beer. It's to brew beer and bless it in the name of Christ and the Virgin Mary. And the king who introduced it was the first Christian king of Norway who was effectively trying to Christianize Norway. So uh, the requirement is not to brew beer because everyone was doing that uh, anyway. The requirement was that they were supposed to bless it in the name of the new gods. Um, if you read the law more carefully, you see more signs that, that it really is so. But uh, I guess that's enough on that subject. Okay, a question from Andre. Um the it, it relates to the Norwegian baking yeast, and does would it uh, does it resemble flavor wise the fresh baking yeast that is used in uh, Finland for uh, brewing sake? No, it doesn't. Um, the Finnish yeast is is very unusual, and the the Norwegian one does not have the same very powerful banana aroma that the Finnish yeast makes. Um, the Norwegian one is more generically fruity. Uh, there's also been a change in the Norwegian baking yeast because the company that made Norwegian baking yeast was bought by a Swedish company. So now the Norwegian baking yeast is the same as the Swedish one. So Gotland Strikke and Stjerdals are now use uh, the same yeast strain, although it's packaged under different names. Okay, and Thanks. finally, what I'm going to do, I'm going to open it up to other people because we, we have got some time, but I'm going to share my screen and apologise to you, uh, Lars, because I'm going to do a little bit of promotion for you because uh, you've given us such an entertaining um, uh, uh, talk. So I don't know if you can see this window, which is your books. Uh, um, uh, uh, Lars, can, is that on the screen now? Is that okay? Yeah, 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 it's perfectly fine. So, so this is uh, uh, Lars Marshall, Marius Garshall's website. The link is on the chat window, so please do have a look. And I'm sure you will want to follow follow up more by having a look uh, and, and buying the uh, the books. I'm sorry about the uh, publicity uh, there, uh, Lars, but, uh, you know. Thanks. We had a fantastic feedback. No, nah, it's fine. But but, there is one more question, actually. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to do you want to react? Go for yourself. Go for it. Okay. So Eric Harding is asking, how often would a one have brewed through the year, and how would the hops have been stored? Simply dried and kept in sacks in the eaves or attic. So um, in Norway, uh, pretty much everyone brewed once or twice a year, maybe three times. So that's really a reflection of how much surplus grain they had. 
Uh, in other countries, this would be completely different. Just, just so I've said that in in Sweden, they might brew twenty times a year or even fifty. Um, okay. So the hops uh, were stored. Basically, what everyone seems <laughs> to have done is to just use paper bags or, or something like that, and yeah, just just. Um, keep them somewhere where they would dry and then just leave it in, in, in the attic until it was time to use it for the most part. Um, I don't think these people were expecting to get very much aroma from the hops, basically. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think we're pretty much done. Um, Lars, uh, oh, hang on a minute. Let's see if there's anything else. I don't want to miss... Miss anyone else? I mean, there's been fantastic reaction, Lars. It's been uh, absolutely superb. And just to remind everyone, the this will all be recorded. So if you know anyone who would find this interesting, please pass it plus the uh, the link forward. It will be uploaded to the EBC website as a YouTube video. So please do come along. Um, Lars, can I? There's, there's another question. Should I do it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Please, please, please do. Let's not stop the questions. Uh, would farmhouse ales be brewed with both juniper and hops? That's from Tom Carroll. For bitterness uh, or preservative or both? Yeah, so um, in Norway uh, and in Sweden and Finland, it was common. Yeah, also Estonia, it was common to use juniper. But um, in Denmark, for, for example, or Germany or the UK, that was not normal. Um, so well, I'm gonna restrict this to Norway to make it make it simpler. Um, it was it, pretty much everyone in Norway tended to brew with both juniper and hops. So I would say something like ninety five percent would do something like that, and it would be for the bitterness. Yes, uh, juniper would also be for aroma, and it might be for color. Um, Hops were definitely used for the preservative effect. Some places that was really the only thing that they were used for. Um, the preservative effect of juniper doesn't seem to be very strong. Um, there was a, a woman scientist who did a study on the preservative effects of juniper against uh, lactobacillus. And she found that yes, there is an effect, but only in concentrations do you're not going to achieve in a farmhouse ale, basically. So it's still possible there might be some effect somehow, but uh, it's not looking promising, let's put it that way. Thanks, Lars. I did ask if there are any more questions, so we'll uh, hang on it just a second, give time for people to- uh, I've just unmuted myself. Uh, yeah, please go, go ahead, Tim. Okay. First of all, hi Lars. I'm really sorry I didn't turn up to our meeting in Oslo in October 2020, but there was a pandemic that arrived, so we had to cancel. Um, I really, we will have that conversation sometime. Um, however, uh, I've just come back from Helsinki and uh, Saaremaa, and this is my first exposure to, uh, apologies if I don't pronounce it right, but Koduolu in Estonia. And uh, that was a great talk, by the way. Uh, okay. And I think it's it's really interesting that if you take if you go around the whole of Northern Europe and you look at these farmhouse sales, there are similarities of technique in groups of different beers. And do you think this is because there was communication between these local groups, or it's just that people learned the basic technique of brewing and then adapted it to their local area? Um, I think there was a bit of both. Um, it's, it's very striking if you look at the uh, the Lauterton, so this barrel with the uh, with the tap drilled into it. Um, there are three main shapes of that, and I mean, that's striking in itself. There's only three main shapes. Um, there's the kurna that the Finns are using that you also find in in um, Eastern Latvia and you find it in parts of Russia, which is a, a wooden trough that's hollowed out basically with a, with a hole either on the side or in the middle. So this would probably have been what people used until um, they invented staved vessels. 
And then everyone seems to have switched to something that looks like a barrel with no lid, with a hole in the bottom and a long rod. It's really, really striking that they all should have come out with the same thing. There must have been communication. And this, this one with the, with the long rod, you find it in the UK, you find it in Denmark, find it in Norway, find it in Sweden. It's, yeah, I find it also in, it's still used in Lithuania and Estonia, as I'm sure you saw. Uh, it was eventually replaced by this tap on the side. And the distribution of the tap on the side is interesting because, for example, in Lithuania, you see it's only used in the West, which used to be the, the German government part. Now, I'm sure that's not a coincidence. Um, this, this, uh, if you look on a, on a map, it really looks like this, this one with the tap on the side was invented somewhere in central Sweden and, and spread out from there. So, but there, there must have been, you know, what they call convergent evolution as well, where people in the same situation happen to hit on the same solution as well. So it must have been a mix of the two, I think. Yeah, because I'm kind of thinking a thousand years ago or whenever, um, there was a lot less communication between cultures, but when the communication happened, it was really important. I mean, the opposite of nowadays, when there's nothing but communication and most communication doesn't matter. Um, we, we have a sort of circuit of it. Um, it's, I, 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 so I'm just interested in whether techniques happen because different people work how that they work or because different people tell each other that they work. I don't, I'm not sure there's an answer to that, but it's, I just think it's an interesting thought. Oh, well, I guess people see that it works for somebody else, right? And, and, and it travels that way. But you also get situations where the technique doesn't travel because it, you get to a region where it doesn't apply, like the, the, the Russian and Lithuanian and Estonian oven brewing never made it into Sweden and, and Norway and Denmark because we don't have that type of oven. It, it just doesn't apply. Um, it's going to be a mix of all of these things. And it's something more of how that works is something that I'm hoping to unravel. But it's going to take a long time, I think. But you can see, for example, that the uh, uh, the soin is the, the, the malt kiln that people were using in Sturdo is not a local invention. Uh, the word actually comes from uh, the Celtic Sodden, uh, which was another malt kiln that's, that's, it's not completely the same, but if you look uh, at uh, ethnographic works from the Orkneys and, and Shetland, you can see a recognizable precursor. Okay, we're coming up to a, a conclusion now, but uh, uh, just a couple of comments, one from Derek, uh, thank you for a, a fascinating workshop um, uh, from Danielle. It's amazing to hear how basic in inverted commas brewing can be if surrounded all day with modern brewing equipment here in Germany. Uh, thanks, Lars, for, for your time. And uh, from uh, Matilda, it was a pleasure to discover so ma many new things uh, 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 and the story. So thanks very much from Italy. So. Really, Lars, I, I just want to say thank you on behalf of everyone. I'm sure everyone's had a wonderful time. Uh, the number of people here has grown over the evening. Uh, normally they fall off after a period of time. So that that's brilliant. So thanks very much, Lars. Thanks to everyone. And we'll see you at the next workshop. When that will be, um, hopefully it'll be in, in, a, in a month's time. We've got another beer to, uh, to talk about. We're just trying to sort that out. Uh, so please keep your eye on uh, on the uh, the EBCU website where you'll find this video and also uh, our next uh, story. Thanks everyone. Thank you to thank you Lars. It's been absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Cheers all.